This is the Open University. Good afternoon, students. I want to think about something that I've mentioned quite a lot in, in these videos in passing, but I haven't really delved into in any detail, and that's the idea uh, Mark Fisher raised in his book, The Ghosts of My Life, which was published, I think, in 2014, that the future has been cancelled. We are futureless. We are somehow the orphans of uh, that sense of forward progress and... Uh, uh, as I put it in my song a couple of years ago, um, good time coming. The good time coming has been snatched away from us. I think it's particularly now uh, we have a, a very cloudy and vague and, and apprehensive idea of the future because of the, the COVID crisis and the climate crisis, which we're in the middle of. And uh, we're sort of just relieved to be alive at the moment, uh, just it being allowed to exist in the present as a living organism is kind of a privilege in itself. But Mark Fisher was talking more about, um, specifically in the book, the, the Ghosts of My Life, I think he's talking about UK music culture and his sense that uh, the, the sense of progress, not, not necessarily, he actually says, it's not, he's not complaining about the fact that there doesn't seem to be a sense of progress, but that the relationship between a particular kind of music and a particular time has gone. In other words, it's kind of the archive, the huge weight of an archive in which all the styles of the, the past are present in the present and can be drawn from by the artists of now means that there is no sense of uh, things being outmoded. And with that, uh, you know, as in natural systems, without death, there is no new life coming along because you need to get rid of the old forms in order for evolution to work. Death is a mechanism of evolution. And culturally, that happens too, that if you don't kill bands <laughs> like Oasis, you know, if they never seem to go out of fashion, you won't ever get um, any kind of movement or any or even any sense of historicity in the development of pop music that if Oasis kind of reminds you of the Beatles. If you're born in 2000, Oasis and the Beatles are contemporaneous. They're, they're coming from the same place culturally. And that means that there's been a 30 year kind of hiatus or something. There's some weird sense. Of, I mean, I don't know how people born in 2000 figure that out. I guess if they're music heads, they will read the histories and they'll, they'll know that one came after. As I, you know, I knew nothing about the 50s. It took me a long time to realize who was progressive in the 50s, why everybody hated Pat Boone when Pat Boone was doing Little Richard covers and, you know, cleaned up versions of, of black numbers for the white market. All these things became clear to me with time. But if, if you just played me a Cliff Richard song and I liked it, like I, I loved um, The Next Time, for instance, which is uh, something Cliff Richard sings in uh, Summer Holiday, that film. Um, it just seemed to be so um, soulful and, and, and hurt and it seemed to align so well with my personal sense of hurt that I loved and covered that song. So um, I, I wouldn't really have cared if that was, you know, actually a, a spruced up, cleaned up, um, neutered version of a really hot black number. Um, it wouldn't have been relevant to me because the, the relevant thing was simply that that connected um, with my emotions at the time, having broken up with someone. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, one aspect of this is my own records, which are actually a really uh, useful way for me to to stay, um, to, to be able to measure whether my music changed and whether, for instance, music that I made in 2005 or 2002 now sounds out of date. And, and to me it does. I, I think um, I can see there being technological or, for, or, you know, weirdly enough, um, I, I was going to say the, the glitch uh, elements in Oscar Tennis Champion, for instance, working with uh, John Talaga, John Fashion Flesh, as he called himself, or just Fashion Flesh. Um, now, uh, although John and John and I are still very friendly and he's very keen to work again together, for me, it's too much associated with that glitch phase, which I was very interested in at the time as a kind of at least a way to transition from one of my songs to the next. It wouldn't really get into the DNA of the songs particularly, but it would trans... I allowed John to do the transitions, to be the reproducer, in other words, to fuck up the music in his own inimitable way. 
And that was all tied in with a, with a philosophy, a very carefully thought out philosophy, um, best spelled out by Kim Cascone in his essay, The, um, the Aesthetics of Failure. Uh, which came out, I think, in the late 90s. And um, so, I mean, I disagree with Mark Fisher, who actually says that 1994 was the last year that technological process, progress was really made. Um, because, you know, for me, glitch, laptop glitch that started emerging in the late 90s was a major um, watershed. Of course, the, the, the one question is, can you ever... And another major watershed, about the same time, 1999, Cher had this song Believe. This is on the negative side for me personally. I hate um, vocal treatments. Most of them. I've done it myself. I did it myself on um, <clears throat> um, Nervous Heartbeat. But uh, the kind of modern pop which uses these fake um, vocodo type um, auto-tuned voices, I really dislike. Um, but it is, you have to say, it is something that started after 1994 and that um, did mark a sea change. So I think pop music has always been more open to gimmicky or technologically motivated sea changes, which really uh, outdate everything. That so a lot of pop music that doesn't use synthesized voices or pitch correction processing sounds wrong now, or sounds out of date, or sounds like it's for a different market. Because I think all the different genres have different ideas of what progress is. So um, I. Uh, I personally, I have to agree with, with Fisher when he says that, uh, you know, a lot of... Um, it, it's almost impossible to say what is retro and what's not now. Uh, I, I mean, I, bought, I went out and bought an accordion. All, most of my technological advances, or personal discoveries anyway, have been into reverse, have gone into reverse. In other words, the things that I find really um, compelling now are antiquarian things recontextualized into the context of my music. So uh, I bought an accordion or I, I found Arabic scales intriguing and started um, embracing uh, Islamic world music. Uh, these are things which are shifts geographically or culturally, but they're not necessarily the future. I don't think it's the future to embrace uh, an accordion. <clears throat> it's a, a rediscovery of something which is old and fantastic and has a lot more juicy personality than most modern synth sounds have, the kind of sounds that are built into your laptop. At the same time, I'm using the, the laptop equivalents of traditional instruments like clarinets uh, and mixing that in with a recorder. You know, the very first instrument I ever learned at school was a recorder, of course, like most people. Um, but I don't think this is the future. And it's that sense of a good time coming or a new kind of music coming. Mark Fisher says, you know, there is no music which we could play now to somebody from 1994, which would shock them and make them say, oh my God, everything has changed so much, I hardly recognize this as music. You could probably find some avant-garde music now which would have that effect, but by the same token, you would have found in 1994 some avant-garde music which would have shocked people who weren't listening to avant-garde music. So it's more, it's more like there's a huge diversity of styles now in which anything goes uh, and a lot is recycled and our sense of progress or of change is largely um, about fashions of recycling. So it's in a way this archive fever, Derrida called it, or the sense of um, hauntology. Uh, other people have talked about it as hauntology. The ghosts of my life is a hauntological premise in a title. Um, it's the sense that the archive um, it, it, it regulates how we um, make music now. And the archive is mediated to us over the internet and in the huge, huge, um, you know, archives, library that is YouTube, for instance, or Spotify, or any, any of these large online corporate digital um, repositories of all the music of the past and all the music of every culture. Uh, and, and that's what I'm dipping into and what most people are dipping into, re-releasing, recycling, recontextualizing already existing things. So um, there, is, there is a different sense. I remember when I was 18, punk and new wave changed everything. There was a, a totally fresh template which arrived apparently from nowhere, from the sky, from the mind of Malcolm McLaren, you know, Johnny Rotten brought it, uh, Johnny Rotten fell to earth and brought it to us. You know, and, and you weren't, there was such a conformist, um, uh, um, 
consensus that you couldn't wear flared jeans anymore, you couldn't play certain kind of guitar solos anymore, you had to play the kind of guitar solo that that Boredom by the Buzzcocks has, where it's two notes and it's just kind of da 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 da. That kind of um, start again from zero sense is something that we will ne- possibly never have again. Or, or it's not that it won't happen in micro genres, but it will never have the widespread effect that it had when I was eighteen, and literally had to go to a tailor to get the uh, wing collar cut off my leather jacket because it didn't look like the leather jacket that Bowie was wearing on Heroes or. Uh, or when I went out and bought some moon boots, you know, and like um, kicker, uh, Italian soft white leather kicker boots, you know, when I was on holiday in Italy. And that made me feel tremendously good because I was sort of in the the stream of the fashions of the day. And I knew that people who hadn't jumped on this particular bandwagon were the losers. <laughs> it's very snobbish, but that's how it worked. So they, they were the losers and I didn't want to be with them. The engineering students who were still listening to Genesis, you know, I mean, later I would actually realize that Genesis were, were rather good. But at the time, it was absolutely unthinkable. So I said, do I pity people for not having that snobism anymore? Probably not. I'm, I probably might be, on paper anyway, quite admiring of the eclectic, of the, the lack of eclecticism of, of young people, my nephews and nieces who listen to music in a totally different way, for whom hip hop has been really important, obviously. Um, and that's another uh, thing which started really in the 80s. And, uh, you know, I think one thing that occurs to me is that you have to map this to human lifespan. <clears throat> the genres are often, um, I mean, Chesterton somewhere says that one shouldn't map the history of a nation to the history of an individual, for instance, and say that Spain has grown a beard or that Prussia is looking a little long in the tooth now. Uh, you know, because countries are immortal in a sense that in the way that individuals are not. But um you can, to the extent that culture is, culture is embodied by influential individuals, Marx, Freud, you know, David Bowie, um, you can map culture, the cultural movement to the lifespan of an individual. And rock has become geriatric. It's, there's no way around it. Pop music keeps getting fresh young staff, you know, young people to uh, <clears throat> keep doing it, keep singing those love songs which people in their teens need to hear when they split up with someone, they need to hear that song about how it hurts. But uh, rock music, which is meant to be more as a self-expression kind of medium, at, at once more conservative, in other words, more tied to values like authenticity and um, timelessness, and, you know, these are these sort of paleo-conservative values, but also it's meant to be more... Um, expressive and artistic and higher up the sort of the food chain in terms of um, its complexity, art rock especially. So um, obviously, you know, even advanced practitioners like Wire are old men now. Uh, I'm an old man now. I'm 60 years old. Momus is an old man. I was kind of conservative though. That's one of the interesting things that emerged from my press clippings book that I read from to you last week uh, is that... um, I already knew what time it was. I already felt like an epigone. I keep using this word epigone, which is the, it means a junior follower, a kind of less important follower of a very important figure. So if I, I, I think once in one of these talks, I, I looked at the history of psychoanalysis and saw how it was kind of mapped to the lifetime of people like Freud. The, the kind of audacious invention from a sort of medical, rather dull medical, 19th century medical perspective of this new sort of humanist science, not really a science at all, actually, a kind of new ideas about the unconscious and about sexuality and about our relationships within families, that that would come, there would would be the foundation of psychoanalytical societies, you know, there'd be conferences, there'd be um, an increasing professionalization through Freud's lifetime and the lifetimes of his followers, the people who'd been really impacted by Freud. I mean, psychoanalysis is a good example because one person really invented it and and, and saw it through to a process at which it could take off, for a while anyway, um, of its own accord. Now, I would say it's in decline because they've all died. All those people are Masood Khan or the followers of Freud, you know, um, there are very few of them left. People like Adam Phillips, um, who I still follow and still admire a lot, 
are carrying the the standard, the banner, but it's it's kind of devolved into this thing we call therapy, which is very different from psychoanalysis. It lacks the audacious intellectual dimension of psychoanalysis. It's just really a, a normative exercise in in kind of curing people who who whose thoughts are tormenting them in some way or another. Um, a lot of critique of uh, therapy, including my own critique of it, is that it's just. Uh, if not medicalizing um, and conformizing, uh, if there is such a word, uh, normal human suffering, unhappiness, uh, things which are perfectly um, to be expected and, and even quite character building if you just ride them. <laughs> so I'm quite old fashioned in that sense. But I do love the intellectual um, audacity of this guy, Sigmund Freud. I think um, delving into dreams, of course, he was reviving something very ancient, which was the um, sort of seer or rabbinical tradition in which um, of the more the Talmud uh, tradition of um, interpretations of the Holy Scriptures and audacious and perhaps far-fetched interpretations of uh, Judaic um, scriptures. So um, you could see that uh, happening in the same the same thing happening in rock music that there would be this explosion in the nineteen fifties, um, drawing on you know the blues men and all the rest of it, but, but a, a mainstream explosion in the mid-50s of uh, this uh, rock format. And, you know, you, you, if you listen to Hancock's Half Hour or whatever, you can hear there'll be an episode of Hancock's Half Hour in which uh, they talk about rock music as if it's just the latest thing. And, of course, everybody expected rock music to last one or two years and then be forgotten, but it didn't. It car- carried on and it became a kind of mainstream the cultural expression, if you like, of the um, the neoliberal era or the postmodern era, whichever you want to use as the label, um, and now it's become to to people like me who got on too late, really, to be enthusiastic early adopters. I was never like David Bowie. Was a he loved America, he loved cars, you know, he loved um, a certain kind of outlook which was totally a rock and roll outlook. Um, you know, hedon, hedonism untrammeled. I'm, although I'm a follower of his, I'm totally the opposite in the sense that I, I subscribe to all sorts of Marcusean ideas about um, repressive desublimation and how um, freedom is really all about just adapting to your circumscription and much more communitarian and collectivist ideals than David Bowie, who was an individualistic, you know, Western anarchic. Um, guy in the end, like most of his generation, they felt that they could do anything if they were simply given their head, if they were allowed to be individuals. Um, so I come in as a, as a, with a critique of that worldview. That's why I've always had a kind of ambivalent relationship with Bowie. That and the fact that Bowie's work took a, a precipitous no, nosedive in the 80s after, you know, scary monsters um, and uh, was very difficult to defend. So it was kind of easy to see him as someone who'd gone wrong in some way. But in fact, it was the whole medium and that whole outlook which had gone wrong and which was no longer compatible with new ways of thinking about masculinity, uh, the environment, um, etc., etc. Of course, Bowie had been uh, working in an anti-masculinist kind of context in the 70s for a while, or was pretending to be under the influence of his work, his first wife, but um, he did, in the end, seem very macho. By the time he found, formed Tin Machine, he was sort of weirdly macho and out of step, I thought, with uh, even people like Nirvana. He was trying to get back to basics in the same way as the Pixies and Nirvana, and people like that. But he hadn't adopted the kind of gender politics that, say, Kurt Cobain had, uh, had adopted. Um, by that stage in his life, anyway, he was acting pretty butch. So. Um, I think I, I, um, I came along with this idea that Dante and, and uh, the Bible might be more radical and, and more interesting, certainly, than that ideology. And I'm still waiting for that to go away. I'm waiting for so many things to go away. The whole um, neoliberal um, panoply of jeans and kind of spangly sports shoes and um, driving your car to the store and, you know, just... Just so many things, <laughs> so many technologies and philosophies of the 20th century. I wish they would disappear. I'm one of the people who would absolutely embrace the current coronavirus crisis as an opportunity to to make a clean sweep, uh, a new broom to absolutely start again. I don't think it's going to happen, though. I think we're just going to, unfortunately, 
we're going to see our Western ideas dying very slowly and in a very toxic and damaging way. We have, according to one news story today, six months in which to fix the climate. Otherwise, there's going to be uh, an absolutely gigantic crisis uh, within the next century. So I, I don't think for a minute we're going to fix the, the climate in six months. You know, we don't have the political will. We don't have the, the purity. We're, we're, we have totally corrupt political systems in many parts of the world. And um, we're unable to regulate even the smallest things because we want we wanted to be unable to regulate. That was our whole mindset and outlook in the neoliberal period. Let's not regulate anything. Things go well when they're not regulated. They might do in a in a certain circumscribed area, but when it comes to fixing the climate or fixing a, a pandemic, deregulation is the last thing you need to do. So. How did we get onto that, to the disappearance of the future? Well, obviously, the, the climate crisis does take away our future in, in a very real sense. It takes away any sense of a benign future for humanity. I, I'd also think that one thing you can keep trying to accuse Mark Fisher's argument of is um, just looking in the wrong place. He wasn't looking in the right places in 2014 for um, new, you know, green roots. Um, fresh types of music coming up. Perhaps he could have found it um, somewhere. Um, and perhaps even geographically, he wasn't looking in the right place because he was looking at the West. He wasn't looking at other, you know, the global South as we're now supposed to call it, the third world, the, um, the other scales, the other modes, the other types of music and, and Asia. Um, I'm not particularly aware of any great new music coming out of China or, or even Japan. For instance, there are things I like coming out of Japan, like uh, uh, records by my friends in, in Osaka, you know, or Taichi and Itamo and people like that who are still releasing music, which I enjoy. But I, I think of Japan as a kind of tranquil and civilized backwater now in, in Asia, which is nevertheless the dynamic part of the world. And um, I don't really see it as the future. I think when I first went to Japan in 1992, definitely walking through Shinjuku, at night with all those bright neon lights that felt like I was I had arrived 15 or 20 years into the future definitely into the 21st century unfortunately having arrived here in the 21st century I realized that that was a 20th century idea of what the future would be like the future turned out to be very different and it turned out to be basically a lot of people clinging to a lot of wreckage um, with greater or lesser degrees of affection the wreckage was saving our lives. Uh, it was giving us our, our identity, our sense of who we were. But of course, that doesn't take into account the fact that who we are, our identity, also depends not just on the past, but on the future. What kind of people do we hope to become? What kind of societies do we hope to become? And that's what we've lost. Um, I, I, I agree with Mark Fisher in that sense. We've lost that firm sense of moving towards the kind of future we would like our identity to embrace and and that's really that means that half of ourselves has gone up in a puff of smoke that's all i want to say today a few ideas thrown out there like uh, fastball fast bowling you call it fast balls fast balls i don't know american metaphors metaphors from a, a dying empire open university 